Oh. Hello, everyone. I can see attendees joining in. Please, uh, I'm going to let a few more people join in before I start with the introduction. So this is just information for those who come in now as well as our panelists today. Okay, the attendee count is going up. Uh, hi, everyone. Welcome to Be Waste Wise. I am Shweta Dandapani. I am the community builder at Be Waste Wise. We organize webinars, two webinars every month on a wide range of topics in the periphery of waste, resources, climate change, and sustainability. And we have moderators uh, from different parts of the world tackling subjects that's uh, that tackling subjects as close to them as well as uh, based on where they are based in. So today we have uh, the topic of today's webinar is behavior change and waste practices. We have Dr. Mansoor Ali, who's a solid waste management expert. He is moderating the webinar. Uh, this is the second webinar that Mansoor is uh, taking part in. Or it's taking part in as part of Be Waste Wise. If you haven't seen the previous one, you can head to the video panel section on our website and you will find it there. So Dr. Mansoor Ali is going to speak to Dr. Lucy Stevens. She's a head of cities fit, head of cities fit for people program at uh, Practical Action, and we have Sally Cavood, who's a lecturer in economic geography. Before I hand it to Mansoor, uh, this is a reminder to all the participants: please drop your questions in the Q and A section. We have time allotted for your questions. We will have uh, the speakers speak initially, and the questions will be taken in the last half hour. So do remember to drop in your questions and this webinar is going to be recorded if you want to come back to it and have a look at it later. Over to you, Mansu. Thanks, Veta, and thanks, Be Waste Wise. I hope you can hear me. Um, welcome to everybody. Um, I think we are very fortunate to have uh, two very, very learned and committed speakers with us. Uh, and I will be very, very brief just to introduce the topic um, and hand over to them. And we try to keep at least 25 minutes for questions and answer and discussions, because this topic is, uh, is, is new, but also very complex and challenging. So don't expect that we know answers to all of your questions, but we will try our best to, to guide you. And in some cases, participants can also, also answer questions. So um, human behaviors in waste management, yes, it was, it was on our head for a number of years. Uh, I was trying to organize uh, things and we approach uh, Be Waste Wise and this, uh, this offer was taken, so I'm really thankful. Now, human behaviors are very central to waste management in almost every aspect, uh, ranging from citizen encouragement to separate waste at source, uh, improved behavior to littering, uh, buying the right products is very much on the agenda use less packaging, generate no food waste and, and many others. So it's, it's really central and it's centrality um, we cannot deny. So that is, that is my first point. Um, what, what we are trying to do uh, in this webinar and, and further discussions is uh, in waste management, waste management there is, uh, these are not also restricted to human behaviors and we must not restrict them as well. So I would include political uh, decision-making in cities um, and towns as also a, a type of behavior. And that's why we, we have a panelist who may be touching on some of these things. A governance aspect, uh, collective behaviors, uh, also post-crisis and after accidents and crisis behaviors. And these are also equally important. So we are trying to take a slightly broader and possibly a new look uh, into behavior change. Um, one of the uh, challenges is despite the core importance of behavior change, uh, we sometimes, some, quite often, I work quite a lot with the donors organization and what my observation is that we take a very rather simplistic approach to, to behavior change. And this assumes that a set of trainings, a set of workshops, communication material, maybe some adverts will change the behavior. Now that's uh, very simplistic and sometimes we don't know what are the results. So this means we obviously missing some opportunities for innovation, uh, testing new ideas, taking a longer term, broader view on this. And we need to be constantly reflective and perhaps learning from media, advertising companies and enterprises who constantly 
uh, think about it because it's, it's, their, it's their core business. So just with this brief introduction, I would like to hand over to, to Dr. Sally uh, Coward. Uh, and thanks to, again, Be Waste Wise for picking up this topic. Uh, and to, today we have uh, these two brilliant presentations. And then after this, we will open the floor for Q&A. So floor is yours, uh, Sally, and I'm looking forward. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Sweta and Mansoor and Lucy and everyone here for the um, generous invitation. So I'm just going to share my screen so that you can see, um, hopefully, where I'm coming from. There we go. So, so as I say, great to be here. Thank you again for inviting me and I hope you're all doing well there in the audience and please do engage with questions um, throughout. So um, my name is Sally Kaywood. I'm a lecturer in economic geography at um, Lancaster University um, up in the northwest of England. Um, so maybe some of you are up there as well. Uh, so yes, I'm a, a lecturer there. I've been there for the last one year or so um, in working in the geography cluster in the Lancaster Environment Centre. And I'll be talking today a bit about my work over the last sort of four and five years, looking specifically at waste workers and particularly those involved in managing human waste. So the last 10 years or so, I've worked on broader sort of water and sanitation issues in Bangladesh and India. But the last four or five, I've really started to look more and more at uh, workers themselves involved in managing human waste. So particularly those involved in um, handling waste in septic tanks, pit latrines, drains and sewers. I'm very much aware, as some of many of you in the audience will be, that there's a great overlap between those handling this um, human waste and those handling solid waste, such as rubbish, uh, dead animals and other things. So maybe that's something we can pick up on in terms of the materiality of the waste itself and why that's important. So I'm going to be coming at it from a diff slightly different angle today. I'm not someone who works on behaviour change necessarily. And actually, as a sort of geographer and critical social scientist, I am often quite critical of behaviour change kind of approaches, just because, as what Mansour, Mansour mentioned, it's something that's very political. It's also deeply intertwined with uh, discrimination and social inequality. So sometimes looking at this through that lens can be a bit problematic. But I think um, that's where I wanted to be sort of clear on in, in my uh, talk today. I'll just talk generally about some observations from my work um, with waste, uh, human waste workers in Bangladesh and also India, um, drawing on some broader kind of um, ideas around you know, what behavior change is in this context from who do we need to change behavior of, for whom and to what ends. So these are some of the questions that, that I wanted to kind of raise. So my work, as I say, does not necessarily come from a behavior change perspective or even a public health perspective, but actually more of a, a worker or people-centered approach, looking at the lived uh, realities and everyday realities of those involved in this kind of work. So what are their everyday experiences? How do they go about their work? What are their challenges? Um, how do they live? Where do they live? What are their priorities for the future? What are their children hoping to do for the future? So a bit more of a social lens on, on who these workers are and what they're doing as well. So that's what I've been trying to look at the last years. And generally speaking, just linking to the wider debate on behaviour change, um, there's three kind of broad areas that, that we can see some important changes happening, but also some, some barriers that we still see um, as well. So society, obviously, that's a huge thing to say. Um, but what we know is that obviously certain people, especially in South Asia, Bangladesh, India, Pakistan, are still involved in handling human waste and handling waste. So particular social groups are involved in this kind of work. So there's key kind of um, perceptions around who should be doing this work, who is still doing this work, and who might be entering this kind of work in the future. And there's some key kind of caste, religious and colonial legacies there that we must take into account in terms of why certain groups are still doing the most hazardous work today and how that might be changing in line with technology and other, other shifts as well. So the kind of societal attitudes towards waste and towards waste workers is fundamental to a lot of these questions. The other aspect to look at is obviously from the, the employer's perspective. So who is actually employing waste workers? Um, and that can be informal pit emptiers. So it could actually be households. It could be municipalities. It could be um, governments employing you know, uh, permanent workers. So I think there's a big question around the role and responsibilities and behaviors of employers who actually uh, pay the wages or um, monitor this kind of work. So that's one other aspect to look at. 
And obviously, as I mentioned, from the workers or the people's sort of perspective of who's actually doing this, the ones that are handling the waste, their families, their communities. So what are their perceptions towards work itself? And that can include things like personal protective equipment, which is a big debate in behavior change around what kind of equipment people should be wearing and why they are maybe not wearing that. It might be uncomfortable, for example, too hot or inappropriate. Um, what the risk risks are, that's a very different perspective of what risk might be. People have very different perspectives on that, especially if you've done this for many generations and you, you're kind of used to this kind of work. So there's a psychological element to that as well. And obviously the nature of the work, which is changing um, as well. And what we see is actually younger people are trying to exit this kind of work of the most hazardous forms and maybe um, enter different occupations, but that's a very challenging thing as well. So just briefly to touch on some kind of findings, um, and do please stop me at any point if I do ramble on, but, um, and I, I would uh, flag a few kind of publications at the end if you're interested to read more, but just wanted to flag a few of the challenges maybe that we can see to changing behavior in a way that might benefit workers and might benefit society as a whole. Um, so I'll draw a bit here on my research, which is ongoing in Bangladesh, but also previously in India, looking at the shift between manual pit emptying to what we might see as mechanical or semi-mechanical through the use of trucks and technology that comes in uh, to replace this hazardous manual emptying work. So you can see here a gentleman with a bucket and a rope. That might be uh, the way that they would empty the waste from a septic tank, for example, which is obviously very dangerous. But then what we see in Bangladesh is the replacement of this kind of work through uh, track, trucks like Bakitag trucks where that would actually suck, suck out the waste and deposit it in a composting plant or um, to kind of process that waste. So a couple of the things that come out which are kind of challenges in terms of how we might improve the work and how we might not leave workers behind is that, as I mentioned, a lot of the minority groups involved in the work, um, whether that's Christian minorities in Pakistan or self-defined Harajan uh, sweepers in Bangladesh, or Dalit uh, subcaste groups involved in India are still kind of losing out in some ways, even with the improvement of the work. So there's concerns around job loss, the fact that technology or technological fixes do not always um, improve the work. They might actually make it more complicated for some workers who might still be forced to go into the septic tank to get the part that the machine doesn't reach. So there's this kind of trade off here around um, the use of technology. As Manchel mentioned briefly, there's also this idea of what can training do, and obviously training can do many positive things, um, but if it's just a one-off occasion or if it's not sustained in some way, then that can obviously also not be necessarily beneficial in the long run. And as I mentioned, there's um, some challenges around improved alternatives uh, with privatization and subcontracting. That can actually be something that actually occurs quite frequently, that people are um, maybe named in a post, but then the, the dirtiest work is still subcontracted out informally to those who are maybe minority workers or unable to access the more secure um, job arrangements. So workers do, you know, deploy many strategies or behavior changes themselves to actually deal with these challenges. These might not always be seen in a, in a progressive or positive way. So changing your name to hide your identity, migrating to large cities to escape discrimination, or even religious conversion to try and access different occupations um, or even higher level skilled jobs. So these are things that, that people do. There's obviously significant improvements been brought about by NGO and government schemes. Uh, um, but again, not all of these are always accessible. So looking at some of those safety nets and how they might be rolled out um, is also really important. And I'm sure Lucy will talk more on this, but the role, the powerful role that cooperatives and other associations can also um, have in this space is also something that we really need to explore further through uh, collective lobbying of workers to bring about change with employers. And obviously encouraging younger people um, to actually look into alternatives and actually supporting them through vocational training and skill development to enter different occupations and improve the waste work as well. So there's different kind of ways we might want to do that. So I'll just wrap up. I've now I've gone into a bit more time, but, but just to say again, that I think it's important to have this worker centered perspective when we look at waste work and behavior change in waste, because historically what we've seen is that the workers have always been sidelined in this process and these debates. So putting them at the center is really important for these kinds of changes. But more broadly, and maybe philosophically, it's also about how maybe we can change societal perceptions towards waste and towards waste workers, when this is a deeply contested and political thing. Uh, and that varies according to country and context and culture. So 
that's something that's part of a much wider debate. How can we ensure that employers um, might bring about positive changes for workers from social security to insurance? And again, there's some positive examples in Bangladesh. I'm sure Lucy will, will touch upon this as well, um, where this is actually happening right now. And how can we support workers, especially younger workers, uh, to improve or exit, exit these most hazardous occupations? So that's it, it from me. I'd be really happy to answer any questions. And there's a list here of, of uh, different publications that might be of interest um, as well. So thank you so much. Thanks, Sally. That's brilliant, bringing a very fresh perspective and a new and broader perspective on, on this issue. Really, thank, thank you. Um, you uh, participants can write their questions in the Q&A uh, area and we will take them after Lucy's presentation. Also some discussion points you can raise. Uh, as, I, as I said, don't expect all the answers from us, but we will lead to discussions. As I know, uh, both Lucy and uh, Sally are available on LinkedIn, so you can, can also connect and, and, and understand what they are doing uh, in their areas of work. So at this point, I would like to hand over to Dr. Lucy Stevens uh, for uh, uh, learning from, from her work and work of practical action. Over to you, Lucy, thanks. I think you are on mute. <laughs> Wait. Okay, yes, better, better. I was getting other things set up and I, I didn't click that button. Anyway, I hope you, can you see the full screen slide? Okay, perfect. Um, thank you. Thank you very much, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here. And what I'm going to uh, uh, talk about is a little bit about what Practical Action has been doing in terms of the work that we've been doing on behaviour change. And some of it will definitely link in with uh, uh, with the points that Mansoor and, and Sally were making at the beginning, especially about how we can make some of this uh, people centred. So um, just just uh, just just to start off practical action, uh, a small introduction. We're an international NGO that works on ingenious solutions to really tough problems. We've been around for 50 year, more than 50 years and, and over at least 25 years of that, we've been working with slum and low income communities across Africa and Asia. Um, and our, our strategy uh, in our cities program involves addressing some of the really systemic issues that keep people trapped in in poverty while at the same time addressing some of their practical needs so we found that that working on helping people to access basic services like water sanitation hygiene and waste management helps them with to engage with planning to uh, improve the incomes of some of the poorest people like some of the waste and sanitation workers that Sally was um was talking about and improving residents living conditions and environment while but also empowering them to be able to connect with with decision makers so that's why we are putting uh that 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 that's the sort of strategy that we are are working on and i guess that being people centered is really at, been at the uh, as a core principle for us in in all of the engagements that we have and our activities um and that's what we were focusing on for example in our recent report uh around waste management um because we're arguing that we really need a big shift to make in waste management approaches to make them overall more more people centered so i guess what does that mean when it for us when it comes to what we actually are doing in in some of our behavior change work that that is uh, a, needs to be a really important part of work to improve solid waste management in the communities that uh, and cities that towns and cities that we're working in like mansoor said there's there's always a need for some some aspects of of behavior change and that might be about how people handle waste and about the role that different um, workers play in waste management, um, in, in the waste management processes. Um, it is difficult. I, I suppose one, one of the things that when, when you're working, I'll just go back one. What, uh, one of the things that's really difficult when you're working in kind of towns and cities, and I think we all know this when it comes to waste management, is that uh, it's not always easy to be effective in kind of behavior change communications in, in those contexts. Men and women 
might connect with different kinds of channels of communication. People are mobile. Uh, there's lots of diversity in terms of incomes, practices, um, where where people are socially. So uh, in terms of sort of high, lots of hierarchies, like Sally was describing. So sometimes that can feel a little bit overwhelming. So I think there are a few things that that we've tried to do to to uh, see how we can how how we can. Uh, approach our solid waste management works and I'm going to be drawing on some of the work that we're doing in Bangladesh we're working to uh, in, uh, in in a number of towns to try to uh, in overall our cities program in Bangladesh works in 10 towns we're trying to make sure that uh, some of it work, works on plastic uh, on, on waste collection and plastic recycling and so on so one of the key, the key things I think is to is to make sure that our core messages are really clear. Um, there might be a number of things that we want to say, but we have to try to make sure that we're not focusing on too many of them. We might be trying to tell people to discourage littering or to stop burning waste openly or to improve the respect for, for waste workers. But actually, if, if the most important thing we want to talk about is, is to encourage people to separate at home, their waste at home, then we need to sort of con concentrate on that, trying to make it really clear and do that in a way that links with what people are already under doing and understands their kind of motivations and the barriers that they might have in, in doing something differently. So if we're asking people to separate waste at home, we might need to make sure that we're reaching women in the house who are the ones managing waste and understand what it is that might make it easier for them and what might motivate what might be important for them if we're talking about sort of stopping littering for example then we might be needing to think about uh some of the attitudes that we found that men have more often in some of these cultures which is that it's somebody else's responsibility if i drop it on the floor someone else it's, it's someone else's job to pick it up so so trying to make sure we kind of uh keep it cl clear but keep it focused uh but think about how one key one key message can be different for different groups. I suppose the other thing is trying to, if we're trying to stop uh, waste waste disposal, uh, this is an example of some of what what we've been what we've been trying to do, which is about trying to be creative and have fun with it. So uh, in Bangladesh, we we used a, a treasure hunt approach, which was about uh, helping to tell people how much waste wealth there is in in some kinds of waste and it was a kind of mystery campaign that went on around the town and then a, a, an event at the end which sort of revealed what it was all about but I suppose the, the point was that we were trying to use a whole lot of different sorts of um, channels of communication and try to make it just a little bit fun but also make it really positive in the sense that we know that um from a lot of the campaigns around uh, things like improving hand washing or uh, trying to encourage people to use a different kind of clean cook stove. If you tell people that this is going to be very bad for their health, they're not like so likely to change the behavior. But if you tell them that this is a vision for how your family can be a better family, you know, can can be a modern family. This is this is a respectful, this is a successful family. This is how they operate. There's much more chance that people will will do that. So keeping things positive, uh, and fun and creative has been has been really helpful. Uh, I think uh, another point we've really tried to reach people at different scales. So some of our work, for example, might go ward by ward, and it can include a whole range of different things, like meeting with CBOs uh, with with community organizations and slum improvement committees having kind of courtyard sessions maybe using video clips um, or the sorts of social media that people might be using um, in those in those contexts and yes people do use social media in in these kinds of communities also finding like young volunteers who can be environmental ambassadors uh, yeah, sometimes some of those things like cleanliness drives, but not so much focused on materials and just one or two trainings, but just a variety of things. Street theatre has been really good in these contexts to bring people together. Um, uh, and then at the other 
level, we might do things that are citywide, citywide scale. So uh, on fecal sludge management, we we worked on uh, sort of citywide, citywide approaches, um, and that can include things like putting up billboards or meeting with. Uh, a range of the different organizations working at that level to bring those people on board um, or, or even a cycle rally to to uh, demonstrate how many people are, are coming on board with that and um, and also uh, uh, bringing on board some of the sort of dignitaries in the town so that you're kind of working at, at different levels and thinking about who is conveying messages about what, so it's not just people coming from an NGO, but it's it's getting buy-in from a whole range of different uh, people, whether it's the voice of youth, whether it's the voice of the mayor, whether it's the voice of um, uh, a women's leader in the community. Um, now, this is another point that uh, Sally was talking about, which is actually how we might be working then with uh, informal waste workers to help them to come together, have a have a bigger voice in improving the working conditions that 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 they that they work with, and to make sure that they that the the work that they're doing is more respected within the community, and that they can have improved working conditions. And helping people to come together as cooperatives has been has been a really successful strategy for that. So also remembering that together as cooperatives, we can help those, those groups to convey behavior change messages that they might want their customers to adopt because they know that those customers can, uh, because that's, that's a sustainable channel for that. These are people who are communicating all the time and not just as a once off in a project. The same with some of those city leaders. They're people who are there for the long term, not a project that might be there for only uh, for only a short term. And I suppose that was one of my, uh, I'm gonna stop sharing that now, but I think that was one of my, my overall messages as well, that, is that behavior change is a long-term process. It needs to be sustained. So we'll also need to keep sort of refreshing and have reminders and and you need to be able to change the way that the institutions who are always communicating with their customers are thinking about it and communicating so in some work that we're doing in Senegal on open burning of waste we've embedded a behavior change component with the waste management authority for the for the city of Dakar and uh, more widely in the country so we can support them and they can, they're the ones delivering the, the messages in Kenya, we might work with the public health department and and their structure of community health volunteers. So, so uh, I think I think that's that that's important. Then and and then just 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 I suppose the other thing is that you can tell people uh, and encourage people to change their behaviour, but they also need to be able to change their behaviour. If you're trying to encourage uh, informal waste workers to uh, wear protective equipment or use new machinery or if you're trying to encourage households to separate out their waste into different components you need to make it easier for them to do that and try to remove some of the barriers so you need to kind of do some of these things hand in hand whether it's providing really simple collection or storage at home solutions or or for, for waste uh, protective equipment things that aren't too hot or that people can actually manage to operate in will be really important. Um, finally, we might try a whole range of things. Some of them will work, some of them won't, but um, it's good to be able to, to, to try, to try the different, to try a range of different of things and to monitor some of the outcomes of that how well are people engaging and to learn as, as we go along, but really the outcomes are in. Are the behaviours changing? Are we? Is, is more waste being collected? Is more waste being separated? So we do try to monitor that and to see uh, how the consumer, how people's feedback is about about you know uh, the, the the different techniques that we've been using. Um, it's not always easy to embed these things in in into projects. Projects sometimes focus on some too much on the technical issues. And put a lot of budget into that. I think when we're trying to design work, we try to make sure that we have a good component around this. I was looking at work that we have that was supported to do with Danida in Bangladesh on plastic waste recycling. And I think it was, you know, 
between around 17 to 20 percent of the overall budget is on this component around uh, behavior change and waste management but that's not always possible with some with some funders but it's always good to try that because I think it needs to be uh, well enough well enough supported that that you can be effective and have it as a kind of ongoing strand um, an ongoing strand for that so so just just to wrap up you know we're uh, we've at practical action we're trying to make our, our work around waste management people centered that means thinking about how people are interacting with behavior change and the different people and the different types of people and the different channels while keeping the messaging simple so because it's complex enough as it is uh, I'll stop there Mansoor I'm sure there are going to be questions and it would be great to have have more of a discussion to uh, pull out some of the key issues that you're seeing thanks Thank you, thank you, Lucy. Brilliant, very good, very applied and, and practical as well. So the floor floor is open. Um, you can write your questions or comments or suggestions. We will try to uh, answer them or or share with with others. Um, I, I really like number of aspects covered very well. I started uh, with the critique that uh, we often take a very simplistic approach. In especially in technical projects on behavior change, do that many meetings, prepare that many leaflets, and some adverts and behavior will be changed. We try sometime or do not get a chance to revisit uh, behavior change. Uh, and then Sally really brought these three layers of society, employers, and uh, workers aspect into these, and they all have a range of behaviors around them and relationships. Um, again, are are very important. I don't think we know a lot about these relationships at the moment in waste sector. So that's again a very good challenge for for all of us. Um, I mean, and Lucy gave a number of slight suggestions, very simple, clear suggestions. One of them is keep it simple, keep it embedded with the community, uh, not too many and complex behaviors. Don't assume things. Uh, and and keep it uh, positive and and fun. So those are all very important lessons uh, for us. How we can do that? I would just like to add two more uh, areas into that. One is uh, in behavior change work, uh, research and projects. There's a lot of unintended behavior change. When I was uh, supervising projects, we found some very interesting elements which we tried not to capture because sometimes they don't fit with our log frames or uh, project plans, but keep an eye for unintended happenings and outcomes. And second is the you know, one of the students' work, which we used in a recent study on uh, emergency behaviors. And that was about the reactions uh, because some of the immigrants and refugees were uh, so marginalized and they, were, they faced so many hardships. As a reaction, they were doing some something, few things which were both negative and extremely extremely positive or extremely negative and it was very interesting element that how those reactions uh, took place so so those are the things uh, i i don't know whether people have any questions or comments or we will again invite uh, lucy sally and sweta to to say a few more things so uh, do you see any questions right in the box? I, we, we do I think there's them. one question that's come up, Mansoor, just now. So this one says how to deal with uh, frustration when local authorities and governments are not as conscious about waste management as we are. Any tip? So, yeah, that's... Uh, I, I can add, but I will hand over to Lucy on this question, that if you're working on a project and the local government is not conscious or not paying attention or maybe slow, what what would you advise to your team, uh, Lucy, over to you for this question? Yes, it's a really it's a really interesting one, because I think that. Often, often I've I've found that local authority it that there are aspects of waste management that the local authorities are really anxious about because they have a responsibility, but they, they're, they're feeling like they're unable to, to really tackle it. And they, um, 
uh, off, uh, yeah, and, the, and and they don't like the way the sort of image it leaves of the town if they're if if there's a really bad waste management problem. They may be spending quite a lot of their budget, but not being very effective. And sometimes I think that can leave them also feeling frustrated. So uh, when you get to talk to the people who are trying to manage that at the at the at the sort of city your local government level they're often quite keen but sometimes their seniors have got other 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 major issues um that, that they're trying to deal with um as as a local authority overall so i think to deal to deal with some of that frustration it does require um building trust and trying to understand where their local authority is coming from and what might be the key concerns that they would have or the key things that will motivate them to change what are they really worried about is it that is it about if this is going to increase their costs or is it that there might be some unintended uh effect of causing them more difficulties like causing more waste dumping if you're trying to stop people from burning waste maybe they'll just end up dumping more waste and then that will give them a bigger problem so I think it's trying to really unpick why it is that the, the, the local authority is not as not as keen to take action and um, supporting them to find ways and also to for them to understand that they're not the only ones dealing with this that there are other actors who can help them that they might not be aware of or be thinking about working with like the informal waste sector which is already doing a huge amount and could play a bigger role than the waste traders and even communities who want to do something about it so helping them to see that they're not alone in all of this is um is something we've tried to do thanks lucy anything you would like to add sally uh, to this you because you touched on the employers so any anything you would like to add on uh, to this question Yes, thank you. And I, I agree yeah, with what Lucy has said. Um, and I think Lucy has a lot more experience in, in dealing with authorities than, than me. But in the kind of more research side, when we have talked to mayors and to local municipal representatives, again, there's there is the desire to do more, especially also for workers. Um, but often they mention that funding is obviously a huge constraint. They don't get enough from the central fund um, locally to actually deliver some of these changes. So and actually to demarcate between the solid waste and the fecal, fecal waste is um, again, sometimes a bit difficult um, and the funding is limited, which obviously has knock on impacts for secure permanent contracts for workers, um, hiring more workers, procurement, and also rolling out some of these more sort of social safety schemes and insurance schemes and others. But that's I think where other kind of actors are coming in to support with that. And I just think we, we probably will touch on this at some point, but obviously COVID has been a significant challenge, um, especially for informal waste workers, but that's something that you know municipalities and authorities are still sort of dealing with. But um, there's only now kind of more realization about the impacts of COVID on workers and on authorities that I think would be interesting to to look more on. And some argue that actually it presented an opportunity to actually lobby more for workers' rights around vaccinations, around better PPE. But others might argue that you know that was maybe a peak, and now it's just gone back to business as usual. So. So maybe we, that's something to, to think about in terms of what external shocks might, um, might what, what impact they might have in terms of the focus on waste and waste work. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Lucy and Sally. Um, and thanks, uh, Nupur, for your suggestion in the chat box about bringing it close to people as much as possible. Um, we, I mean, I when I work with the local authorities, especially the small uh, local authorities in small towns and medium towns, um, what I found is there is a lot of uh, keenness to do things. As Lucy said, there is a real constraint uh, in terms of the skill set and the resources, but also the the creativity. Uh, some of the things they are doing, you need. Uh, I I needed more time to understand it and appreciate it. Um, one of the challenges with, I think Sally also touched, is the uh, when you have an international project or an international organization doing a project, and when you talk about some grassroots issues, there's always this confusion that why this international organization doing not doing big things and talking about people or workers or slum dwellers. So sometimes that uh, surprise or panic is there, but. Uh, I'm sure it's not the case with 
those who are working in countries for many, many years because now they know their role. So we have another question from Rafiul uh, from Bangladesh. Uh, Rafiul would, is interested to know more about the treasure, treasure hunt approach in Bangladesh and um, what are the results and are there anything changes? So you, can you elaborate that? I think that question is directly uh, for Lucy. Thank, so thank you, you Raphael, yeah. and great to have you uh, participating in the webinar. Thanks for your question about about the treasure hunt approach. We've uh, we've used that in a number of towns over time, and I and I think one of the um, one of it, it's difficult sometimes to unpick because that it's not as if we have done a scientific kind of analysis of if you if you do everything but not. Not, not that component in one place would it have a different effect you know it's hard to get the kind of comparison so what we have been able to look at is the is how we is is some of the impact like what were the outcomes we would we were aiming to achieve and one of the things we were trying to do with it with the treasure hunt approach was to get encouraged this was related to sanitation encouraging more people to use the pit emptying use the pit emptying services that were taking the waste safely away rather than just uh, emptying and dumping in the nearest drain. And we found that we improved the rates from about 10% um, of, uh, of all the san sanitation waste up to about 40% of all the sanitation waste. And I think without some of that behaviour change, we would never have got to that point, although it's hard to exactly pin it down. But I think what now we've reached a point where we need a slightly different message because now we've reached a point a sort of a new limit in terms of that and we will need a slightly different message if we're going to jump to the next level because it's to do the there's now a barrier in terms of the design of the toilets and the tanks which are uh is meaning that people aren't so encouraged to use the emptying services i could say more about it Raphael, but i think uh I think it's it's been successful, but now we might need the, the next stage. And I think that's sometimes what happens with behavior change. You know, you address one thing, but then the next thing, the next thing emerges. Yeah, thanks, Lucy. Um, can you take the last question uh, in the box? And I take uh, the comment from Lisa Ella. I, I feel it's it's a very important area which you picked up, Lisa, mm -hmm. on the contracts versus uh, long-term aspects, which we, we like to see in, in things like behavior change or attitude change, because uh, this is what I found a challenge in throughout uh, my work and working in project management and then also working and see the things on the, on the ground. We don't, my understanding is that we don't have a, a, a proper contract management design for some of the things like behavior change so when you have deliverables or outputs and some of these languages and you have six months to spend quite a substantial money and then you are working on some of the longer term things, uh, then you have to compromise or you feel some of the professionals, uh, like myself, I feel very bad about it because it, it it's like unfinished business. So yes, it is, it is a very important issue. And uh, what... Uh, we all can do is to raise the awareness uh, among our communities, especially among donors and governments, that the the short term or the traditional contract designs do not lead to um, uh, neatly to some of the longer term uh, issue, issues or challenges. So it's a good point. I don't know whether you would like to add anything, Lucy, on, on this point, the spending money and short term mm. contracts versus longer term aspiration. Mm, yeah, it's really... It's really, it's really a struggle and, and, a, and a practical action. I, you know, I, I recognize that understanding some of the consultancy work that that might be involved. And I also saw there was a question which was a bit similar from Rachel in the, in the chat box, which was about getting donors to design waste planning and behavior change into the project design and not put you know not putting it they sort of neglect that element or only put a small bit in or only parcel it out to consultants for a short-term period oh we'll just need a few months of that and then we can concentrate on the big infrastructure spending or or whatever else is is planned in the big project and I think what I 
I, I think one thing that might be worth trying trying to know, I think we need we need to really check we that there needs to be a broader kind of uh, shift to try to educate uh, and change the way that those those kinds of funds and projects are designed. One one thing might be to try to encourage donors to spread their in, increase the budget a bit because this is never going to be the biggest element of a of a big infrastructure project. So why not you know make that more effective and just put a little bit more into that, and then you can. And also to try to spread it a bit more over the course of the over the course of the project, rather than just seeing it as a short once off thing right at the beginning, and then you still have five years of infrastructure building or whatever. Um, I suppose another I don't know whether this would work. I'd be interested to know your thoughts, uh, Lizella. But what one might be, could you use that time? to try to help create a plan with some of the other stakeholders of behavior change they could try to carry out over the in in, a, in, a, in the longer term i know that's not what the what the uh what the donors are necessarily asking for but is there any way that we could sort of ch change things around a little bit to say yeah we'll do some delivery but also we'll try to make a plan with stakeholders and see if we can lobby for that plan to be funded over over a longer period of time rather than just making it a once once off short term short term thing because habits don't change overnight as we know and they need to be continuously kind of reinforced you have to keep practicing something for a certain amount of time before it becomes a habit i think and then you just need to be keeping kept reminded about it every time you go into a bathroom often there's a little notice that says have you washed your hands it's like it's not and and our our parents have told us wash your hands after you go to the toilet since we were children, and we still need reminding. Yes, we still need reminding. So it can't be like a once off thing, right? You need to you need to kind of refresh it. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Sweta. Do you want to pick up the next question? Is there a? I think there's a question from Rachel, and there's a question about not in my backyard so resistance oh, from yeah. the community in fact uh, last field work six months ago i was doing in a city and this was one of the big issues that people uh, demonstrated and attacked a transfer station and and then i i probe uh, in the short term i probed the reason and one of the big reasons was the, that transfer station which obviously a proper transfer station it costed uh, substantial money was not operational properly. So there was all the waste around that transfer station. There was burning and smell uh, control and, and gases. So they, the people in the vicinity, obviously they were there was a low income group, they registered it. So from my perspective, if these facilities are operational well, and there are examples from countries, uh, I remember 15 years ago, Manus Coffee used to share this small transfer station examples from China where people live above the transfer station and nearby so um so one is the operational aspect but uh, i don't know whether anything you would like to add uh, sally or, uh, or lucy on, on this point about the the community behavior and resistance not to build things close to where they live yeah i think some of these really practical and material aspects about where things are located and how they're managed is is can can't be kind of underestimated it's really it's really fundamental and people like convenience and you know they come with their waste and if they can't if there isn't they they uh, if there isn't any other option they'll just dump it there at the side or you know so i can i can totally understand why why that's the problem and sometimes um i think i it's it's not easy and and we just need to make sure that we put enough emphasis on really tightening up the kind of management and operation and management structures around around things like transfer stations um because people may have had experience of of some kinds of waste collection points or something in the past it's not surprising if those haven't been well managed that they're likely to to say no 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 thank you because this is going to be a hazard in my in my community so so but but then on the other hand to be well managed but perhaps that community could be an asset in the future if they want to make sure that if they can see something that is going to be functioning 
and fun- functioning well and that people who aren't handling it, things well can be kind of uh, kept accountable and made to kind of uh, repair and, and uh, do better. So, uh, yeah, no, I realise it's, it can be very, it can be a really tricky, a really tricky thing. People want their waste just to disappear, really, but that's not always possible. So, <laughs> yeah, no, I just want to jump in quickly there as well. I think after visiting various sort of fecal sludge treatment plants, there is a big question around, you know, different systems. You know, there's a lot of dis- discussion at the moment about decentralized systems, which means more fecal sludge treatment plants, more focus on the FSM chain. So there is a real need to kind of understand, you know, people's relationships and perceptions of these plants. And I know that there's attempts to sort of beautify them, create them, you know, make them into sort of open public spaces that people can go to, to to challenge some of the negative perceptions about smell and about kind of the exposure to waste. But um, that's, you know, that's a long way off. But the reality is, if we're going to push for FSM, then we need, we need to understand more about people's perceptions to the the nimbyism of having these in their local areas because this is a reality for some areas um in the medium to long term so yes but it's a very interesting question and a challenge yeah and then there are a couple of points from rachel and lisa about the action planning um, and planning for the projects and the uh, upfront investment in planning but also awareness building because Sometimes donors do not allow that amount um, in the projects. It's it's a it's a real challenge. Uh, one or two suggestions from my side is, uh, um, especially on action planning. If people do not see any results coming out of the action planning or nothing is happening, then they get tired of the of some of the planning practices. So avoid that as much as possible. As Lucy said, involve people uh, in a creative way. And if the results are not coming because of uh, local authorities or another uh, donor projects or something else, then try not to uh, burden people with more more planning. Um, On these points about the upfront investment and the waste planning, it's quite a big issue for large cities. It's it's the there is a debate that whether planning works or not. Or at the moment, it's it's about large projects actually for large cities. So uh, how to avoid it? So I, I don't know the answer to that, except that you can create more awareness. So linking one project to another project, as Lucy suggested, is another idea that if you're ending one project, see how it links up with the next projects or what you leave in the institutions and policies. So these are my quick thoughts on that point, but uh, I don't know anybody would like to add anything. And Lucy, do you want to say anything on the action planning uh, point? Yeah, it's a tricky balance because um, at, on the one, it's a tricky balance because you do need to kind of make sure that you've involved people um, really credibly and not as a kind of uh, just as a paper exercise or as a just something people you've done very light touch and then you go, go away and do the thing you'd plan to do anyway. People need to see that you've genuinely paid attention and that they've made an impact. But at the same time, if you if you take too long over that and there's no action coming out of it and nothing actually happening, then it's very it that that then you've wasted people's time and time is very precious for people. Uh, they they have a lot of other commitments and a lot of things to do, uh, money to earn, and you know you're 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 taking people's time. So, so it is it is a it is a tricky balance, and I think we do need to make sure that we have if we're going to involve people with plant in in aspects of planning, that there are quick wins that you can of of some kinds of action that can be taken in a in a sort of shorter term, uh, while you might be trying to work on some of the bigger things in the longer term um yeah otherwise yeah, yeah it's thank you i think we are close to the end time there's a suggestion from mamta jain about like a global body on behavior change and and take a more paced approach to it so i'm not aware it's a good suggestion i'm not aware of that because uh, 
um, in number of cases, it's with the different sectors and projects. So we we take we take that point on board. I hand over to Sweta now uh, to for for closing. If there are no more comments and questions, I think we are we are very very close to the end time of this webinar. Thanks very much, uh, Lucy, and Sally, and all the participants for very active participation. Thank you. Thank you, Mansoor. Before I close, I just have a quick question for both Lucy and Sally, and maybe even Mansoor. Do you have any closing comments so that we could? Uh, I'll hand the floor over to Lucy first. If you have any closing comments, and then Sally, and then we can close it after that. Uh, only, only to say that I think you know waste management is a really fundamentally a people centered, a people centered thing, and we need to find ways that we can put people at the heart of that and understand who they are. Uh, keep our messages simple, but make sure we have these behavior change, sim behavior change messages. And just try to be, to, to try a whole range of different things at different scales. Uh, yeah, that would be that, that would be some of my key messages. Thank uh, you, Sally. Thank you, Lucy. Uh, Sally, where you, your closing comments? Great. Well, thank you again, at all. Um, just also to see, I see that Raphael uh, put something in the chat and. Uh, nice to see you as well, Raphael. Just to link in with what, what he was mentioning there, I think we do need a holistic approach um, that looks across sectors, so with the government as well as different actors. So, for example, with sanitation workers, we need to look not only at a public health perspective, but crucially at the worker-centred uh, approach and also look at labour rights and also bringing in, where appropriate, Dalit uh, rights as well, trying to bring these different um, approaches into conversation together to have a more holistic uh, understanding of the challenges. And as Lucy said, looking um, yeah at the people kind of centred approach, I think is key, key to that. So yeah, so that's what I'll end on. Thank you. Thank you, Sally. Uh, thank you, Lucy, and thank you, Mansoor. Uh, we had a great conversation. We had pretty good participation from the audience as well. This is just information for the audience. The webinar is going to be recorded. It will be available on demand on Zoom. And uh, after two weeks, it will go up on the Waste Wise's YouTube channel. You can go and subscribe on our YouTube channel and you'll have access to it. We have another webinar next week uh, on a topic based in Caribbean. So please, uh, sign up we send out email announcements you'll find the link on linkedin you'll uh, find it on our zoom as well so please go ahead and sign up thanks a lot everyone have a uh, good day bye-bye thank you bye